So, without further ado, uh, Port Knox Gold Trains by Mr. Jim Murray. Thank you. It's a golf mention that Jim comes to the archives yes. and digs into our archives. Yeah, I am a big user of archives uh, <laughs> and a big believer in them. So, you know, I, I can, you know, uh, sympathize with what Harry's talking about putting stuff and people actually using them and everything. Uh, I burned about a half a tree of paper uh, yesterday alone, copying stuff that I found just rattled in banker boxes. It's kind of like, oh, this looks fun, and go through it. And, and, yeah. and the outcome of that is things like this, because everything has a story, you know, how you got interested. And as I mentioned to Harry on the way out, some of you might heard it, that I recognize those pictures of his, uh, the Withrop Harbor Station, uh, the Zion Station. I went to high school in Zion. Uh, I lived about eight miles due west of Harry on State Line Road in Russell, you know, wide spot in the road, which people back prior to the change of the laws, uh, the big business for Russell, or a couple miles west of us, where 41 Cross uh, State Line Road was, selling margarine to people from Wisconsin. Uh -huh. not buying uh, blue bottle margarine in the state of Wisconsin. Right. And uh, you guys remember that. Yeah. And so uh, my family had a farm in Russell since 1845 or so. We've been there a while. But anyway, uh, so I used to ride the North Shore down to Wrigley Field. I mean, you know, back when you could do that in the late 50s, early 60s. So anyway, getting into this. Uh, use the arrow. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Is, uh, up goes, whoop, we need, which so one's forward? Forward is right. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Uh, those of you, uh, you know, old enough, like most of us, you recognize this is, uh, you know, what Lionel thought it was for uh, moving gold to Fort Knox, uh, yeah. according to their catalog. And uh, uh, Naomi couldn't be here. She had, she has a real job. And so uh, this is uh, kind of me on my own. And normally she would run the computer and do all this AV stuff. So we'll see how well I can get it done solo here. Okay, so today's presentation, we're going to talk about uh, moving gold into Fort Knox. And uh, so this is kind of your newspaper, who, what, where, when, why. Uh, who did it? Well, Franklin Roosevelt did it. And the reason was, this is the Depression. You know, this happened in uh, 1933 and on. Uh, they were worried about, they had the runs on the banks, they had the closed banks. Uh, my step-grandfather lost all of his business things when the bank went under, he deposited it at night, the next morning the bank was gone, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, the gold was stored in New York and in Philadelphia, and then uh, it happened in a couple different moves. And then what it was, it was 84 mail trains. You wouldn't think mail trains, moving uh, the gold bullion of the United States, but there you go. And as it says, the greatest long-distance move of gold bullion in history, still is. <clears throat> There's a picture of Fort Knox, the, de the gold depository, which is next to the Army base, but not on the Army base. They're adjacent. And so it was a WPA kind of project. They, they built it, took about a year, and it's a lot of it underground, a lot of it not, and it's, it's a big bank vault, put it that way. It was the fact that the gold was being moved in there was very public. I mean, this is an article out of the Chicago Tribune. Gold shipment due tomorrow. Yeah, not a biggie. Uh, what they didn't publish was the exact timing as it went down the tracks between New York or Philadelphia or whatever. That part was kept close hold, uh, but, but they actually put it on there. And it, they came in, it was a unit train, they never broke it up. It went in, came in on Wednesdays, came in, in on Saturdays, went northbound the other days. So, like I said, a couple moves, 39 trains in 1937, and then again in 1940, 41, uh, a total of 551, 52 car loads of gold bullion. And uh, it, it left uh, the New York City Assay Office, which is in Manhattan, uh, and it still has vaults there, was uh, where it was stored, and had been since uh, the days of the gold rushes. Uh, I mean, the US government bought gold from miners, and it eventually went to there or to one of the mints. And in this case, the mint that stored it was, was Philadelphia. It took five railroads because of the routings, uh, depending on if you were coming out of New York or Philadelphia. So you had New York Central, Penn State, Louisville, Nashville, Baltimore, Ohio, and the Illinois Central. Uh, train composition, normally 12 cars. Like I said, it ran basically like a unit train now today, hauling uh, coal or grain or anything else. Uh, it was made up of an empty mail storage car, i.e. baggage car, uh, which was just right behind the locomotive. It was a spare car in case something happened to one of the others. 
And then there was a combine, which was the baggage for the people on the train. And then six mail storage cars with the bullion in them, three sleepers and a diner. And the Pensy did all the uh, modifications to the baggage cars, which mostly involved on how you were going to uh, secure the load. And we'll see some interior pictures in a minute. And I've seen references that I couldn't double check and verify, but they also might have changed the springs out on the trucks uh, to carry heavier. Uh, these are one of those that were kind of weight restricted. It wasn't volume. You, you can't stack gold bricks from the floor to the ceiling on a baggage car unless you've got like you know, massive trucks under this thing. Okay, gold brick. Each one of those little bricks is 400 troy ounces, which is not exactly like ounces like we use them, but call it one of the same things. And those weigh 27 pounds a piece. And my brother and I were watching a movie on the TV uh, earlier this morning, like the Italian job or something like that. And they showed these guys taking a couple of gold bricks and putting them in a briefcase and walking around. No, 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 you're not gonna do that. <laughs> but anyway, the, the uh, price of gold in those days was $35 an ounce. Yep. And we're gonna uh, get a little bit farther, but up until 1933, the real price was $20 an ounce. That was the price that the US government would pay. Uh, and and you could actually exchange uh, 20 U.S. paper monies, and they would give you a uh, gold double eagle, which was one ounce of gold. But the government, the first thing they did after they pulled back the gold is they changed the official price from $20 to 35 So on the books, the federal government made a 75% profit by just a stroke of a pen. But that's government accounting. Yeah. They're still doing that. Yeah, they're still doing that. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, it, they were, uh, the bricks were packed in uh, oak boxes, and we'll have a picture of those in a minute, 500 pounds a box, and four boxes a pallet, so a ton on every pallet. So they were pretty good pallets. They weren't the cheap, uh, you know, uh, economy-grade pine that we see nowadays. Uh, 120 boxes a car, so roughly 60,000 pounds of gold per car. And in those days, prices $25 million a car. Okay, there's the cart that they would use. You notice they're solid iron wheels, and those are the boxes. And as you, if you look at the corner uh, braces, they're kind of hooked over. You could actually put a, like a steel rod there to help lift it. That's how they had to do it. Or you had to be a really strong guy. Okay, there they are in the car. And you can see it's uh, got blocking around it and everything. And it, there they are just uh, packed in there. And notice where it's stamped US mail. There's a reason for that. <clears throat> now I mentioned that uh, there was five railroads, but the Illinois Central was the only one that carried every single carload of gold. And that was because the trains would come down from either New York or Philadelphia, run along the Ohio River and got to Louisville. And from Louisville, there's a branch line that ran down to uh, uh, Fort Knox, it's, it's hard to read, but basically the, uh, the second small name underneath Louisville there is Fort Knox, uh, right there. It's, it's actually like 12 miles out of Louisville. And uh, it, it was dispatched out of Paducah. That was the division headquarters for the IC for their Kentucky division. Now, obviously on something like this, they, they did some planning for it. They did full rehearsals with the guards uh, they, they literally put in machine gun emplacements, uh, bridges, tunnels, any place that could be ambushed. I mean, this is the days of gangsters running around Chicago shooting up things, you know. Uh, they cleared all the underbrush from underneath the bridges and things. They put in temporary phones on the north end of each bridge. You think about it, because the loaded train is going southbound, so they're only worried about the north end of the bridge. And then uh, they put every spare part they could think of that they might need on the road in that uh, uh, baggage car. Uh, you know, the normal things, uh, hoses, uh, couplers, you know, uh, you, you name it, and then other things for the locomotives and pedals. Security, they had a, a flagman at the north end to stop the train if they needed to. They had a motor car that ran ahead. They had army detachments at what they considered to be choke points along, along the route. And they did bridge inspections 30 minutes prior to uh, arrival. So this is a lot of the same stuff they would do on moving the president. This is the same kind of stuff. Uh, I can't remember if they actually spiked the switches, but they were doing just about <coughs> everything else. Okay, here's on board the train. Okay, you had four post office inspectors. 
uh, basically supervisors in this case, the law enforcement side of the post office department, 12 RPO clerks, two army officers, 32 soldiers, which would deploy anytime like for engine changes, crew changes, they deployed around the train, and basically one platoon of infantry, and then at least in the IC and probably the same in all the others, there were two railroad special agents that rode, one in the cab and one uh, back to go with the army detachment commander. And the guy in the cab in the IC carried a shotgun. That was, they made a point of that. You know, as everybody was armed. I mean, this, the, the post office clerks and everybody, this wasn't just uh, uh, unique to them, but it was just different. And each locomotive and, uh, and crew was provided by the railroads. They didn't run through uh, power on these things. So here's the basic schedule. We mentioned already before, they arrived every Wednesday and Saturday. It, it took six months to run the trips for the first, uh, the first batch. And the first one was in uh, January 13th of 37, and it came from Philadelphia. It had $200 million in, in gold on board, and that is in the, the $1933. Hmm. Excuse me. Now, the second train was actually delayed because 1937, there were massive floods on the Ohio River. They couldn't get into Louisville. The tracks were underwater. And uh, so it got, it got delayed, but it, it had a little bit smaller load, but, but not much different. And so by uh, six months later, they moved 39 trains, and in those days, the equivalent of five and a half billion dollars, which, you know, you consider you were buying a car for $500 uh, new from the factory, you know, it went a ways. So that was 445,500 of those gold bars. So, uh, they thought they were nearly done, okay. Uh, they, they moved all the stuff into Fort Knox, and everybody was happy. And then about three years later, two years later, we changed the laws. There, World War II had already started in Europe. You know, and, uh, and the US, and initially, we didn't do anything. I mean, we were completely gonna be isolationist about this. But then they passed what they called Neutrality Act. And basically, it, it meant that we could sell arms and uh, airplanes, whatever, to anybody. But it was cash and carry. And you paid in US dollars, okay? So the way you got U.S. dollars, if you were uh, uh, France or whatever, is you bought dollars and you bought them with gold, okay? So by 1939, this money is being deposited in New York. The New York Assay Office was where international payments were always uh, settled. And it, it still is, basically. And so uh, there was more gold now sitting in New York again than there was in Fort Knox. So we got to do something about that. So, 1940, 41, we moved them again. And they used the same pattern. They already had a plan, they knew it worked and everything. And they ended up moving three times more than they had. So now we're up to 649 billion or million ounces. Uh, <coughs> and as I've put on there, currently the last figures I could get from 10 years ago or so, it's about one fifth that amount that's still there. It gets sold out for everything from, uh, uh, you gold plate a lot of uh, satellite parts that go into outer states. Uh, you, you sell it to goldsmiths, you sell it to dentists to fix your teeth. I mean, it, it gets used. It's not like it's uh, being stolen. But uh, anyway, so this is showing them uh, unloading the, uh, the vaults in New York. You can see the little vaults on the right-hand side. And then there's the mail trucks leaving the, the SA office. And a convoy of motorcycle cops and mail trucks going through New York. Go down to the yards to uh, load. The, I love the guy with the uh, the sidecar there. <coughs> <coughs> and there we are. Uh, they got them on hand trucks, and they're pushing <coughs> those uh, uh, little uh, buggies we saw. Her. And now we're inventorying them because everything is obviously going to be inventoried. <laughs> and so the guy with the the clipboard and the fedora is uh, doing his bit, and the guy next to him. Uh, the far right guy, you can see he's wearing a gun belt. <laughs> and now we're down to the yards. Uh, uh, Pensy V60 uh, series uh, baggage cars that have been modified, and the Army guys deployed around it while they're uh, getting ready to load. And now we got the mail trucks backed up, and the sleepers were put on the back end of the train. The gold cars were to the front. And here's the only shot I could find of one actually uh, kind of in, in motion or whatever. And so you can see the extra flags on the locomotive. And this is, uh, uh, I 
believe this one's an IC engine. I can't really yeah. see. Yep. Looks yep. like it. And then uh, you can see right behind it's the spare baggage car with the with the parts and basically the spare car in case they had to pull one out of this train. And then the combine behind it for the bullion cars. So when they got to Fort Knox, they hired local guys, you know, local uh, unemployed farmers or whatever to unload it. And it took five to six hours to uh, unload it. And they're going into army trucks, as you can see there. And more of the unloading. And there's the official 1940 version armored car from Fort Knox, cavalry unit there. And we've now made it to the building. And okay, the guards there, like the guy with the uh, Thompson submachine gun, those are treasury agents because the gold repository belongs to the treasury department, not to the army or whatever. And so they're there. Oh. And the only place I could find that the, the revenue, and of course this is being run as an extra train, so they got to pay, you know, so many they got to pay the passenger fares for all those soldiers and everything. And then uh, there was a special train charge, whatever they they charge for the use of the cars and things. And, uh, and then they, you know, shipping mail was, the post office paid, you know, X number of, of uh, mail bags per car was considered where, so you paid so much per car to move mail. So the IC actually got uh, $313 per trip to move that $5 billion worth of gold. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason it was sent as registered mail, which is another reason for the clipboard, because they had to record the numbers of everything, and then the numbers when it got to the other end, and somebody signed for it, is because of all the federal agencies, the Treasury Department, the War Department, whatever, the only one who had the authority to insure a shipment was the post office because registered mail was insured, just like sending mail now. And so they were the only agency, which is why they were in charge of the move. Oh. Now, the next one, it's, it's not 100% related to that, but I just thought it was interesting. Uh, one of these things I stumbled across, you know, going through archives and stuff, uh, well, kind of like the whole gold thing here, I stumbled into that because one of my brothers worked as a baseball coach at Western Kentucky University for 27 years. And I was there visiting him one time, and while I'm waiting for the game to start, the university library was just a couple blocks from the ball field. And I was in there just killing time, and I found this book that said Railroads of Western Kentucky. And so I looked in there, and it had excerpts from the IC employee magazine that talked about the gold move. And that was the only place I'd ever seen it, and of course, kind of copied it and filed it away. And 10 years later, it's kind of like, oh yeah, that'd be fun for a, for a presentation. So I got that. Well, same thing here. I'm doing some more research, trying to find some pictures to put this together. And I stumbled across something that talked about a secret move of documents from the Library of Congress to Fort Knox in 1941. And I go, never heard of that before. And, you know, like, like, why would you do it? And why was it secret and all that? So what we got here is the, the man that was the Librarian of Congress and in those days, things like the, uh, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, the things that are now on display in the National Archives, in those days, they hung on the wall in the Library of Congress. And, uh, and the man that was the, appointed by FDR uh, after he became president to be the librarian, which is a political job, he was the, had been the president of Harvard. His real academic training work, he was a poet. That was, he was a published poet. And so he, he ends up being the librarian, okay? And, 1940, the war is going pretty good in, in Europe. I mean, the French have already surrendered, the, the British are being bombed and everything. And so he gets his staff together and he says, you know, we've seen all these libraries and universities and everything just burn to the ground in Europe, losing all this stuff that's, you know, priceless kind of stuff. He says, we need to put together a plan because I think we're going to be in this war. And so they started at the, uh, in December of 1941. He says, go through it, inventory everything we've got and divide it up into categories. You know, tier one being the most valuable, irreplaceable, and tier five being, you know, copies of the congressional record or something. You know, you just work it down into in what you can replace and what you can't. And then another uh, group went out and started surveying, like, where can we put this that's bomb proof and it'll be preserved around Washington, D.C. And they did everything. They checked the railroad tunnels under the mall. They, they uh, went all over and everything had a problem. It's like either the roof leaked or it was a fire hazard or it was whatever. And so they decided there was no safe place in Washington, D.C. and they may not have time or money to build something. So what they decided to do is they, 
they have to be talking to the Secretary of the Treasury, and he says, I can make one of the small vaults, vaults in Fort Knox available for you to put stuff in. And so uh, that's what they decided to do. And so the tier one items, which was only eight things, eight pieces of paper, and so that fit in real easy. And then uh, they went through, and it, it turned out that they moved not only the eight things, they ended up moving 5,000 boxes of stuff out of Washington, D.C. at the beginning of World War II. And the other stuff went out to uh, uh, colleges around Lexington, Virginia, and uh, uh, I was going to say Oberlin, Ohio. But anyway, in Ohio, and then also to another, uh, another group of stuff that went to North Carolina. And only a handful of people knew the exact locations of what was going to go where. Uh, one thing, I mean, if you ever read history about stuff, FDR was terrible about keeping a secret about anything, and his wife was even worse. And so they, they, they didn't tell him. And we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so anyway, uh, the first move was done literally less than three weeks after Pearl Harbor was bombed. So the war had just started, and they got it out of there immediately. So here's the things that they, they labeled it the Charters of Freedom, and those are the eight things that they moved. And one of those wasn't even ours, that Magna Carta copy. It, was, it belonged to the British government. It had been in the, the Lincoln uh, uh, Cathedral in England. And it was actually on display in the New York World's Fair, which was 1939-40. And because the war was going on, Winston Churchill said, can this stay in America? Because we don't want to risk trying to bring it back through the you know, submarines and the bombs and everything else. But uh, those, the little footnote there, the asterisk, where it says original signed and gross copies, that is like for all practical purposes, that is the original. You know, uh, John Hancock's name, it was like they, they took the uh, draft thing, they took it to the printer, they printed a copy, they took it back, and everybody hand signed it. So those are the, the originals. So here's a little timeline on it. Okay, on the 23rd of December, they packed those eight items in bronze cases, sealed it with lead, uh, packed it with that uh, Excelsior stuff, that packing material they used back in those days, and then put them in wooden crates uh, and, uh, and wrapped it in brown craft paper because they figured that made it look very inconspicuous, tied ropes around it so you could carry them. And of course, it's fairly light. Basically, one guy's carrying it. And uh, they were ready to go. They didn't want to talk to the president or anything, but they got this attorney general to write a letter saying, I believe the Librarian of Congress, as his, on, on his own uh, authority, can do anything to safeguard any of his uh, resources that he wants to. So in other words, they didn't have to get the president's permission to move this. They didn't have to get anybody's permission. He, it was all his, his authority. It was his library. He could do what he wants with it. And so once they had that, they said, OK. And so literally that night, uh, as you can see there, they took it from the Library of Congress Annex, which had loading docks. Just a mile or so from Union Station in Washington, put a regular commercial armored car, drove it up there. They went through the baggage room, came out on the platform, loaded it into a compartment in a in a standard sleeping car on the uh, the Baltimore, Ohio uh, National Limited. The train pulled out. The only people with it was one Secret Service agent and the Assistant Librarian of Congress. There was no big guard detachment. It was pretty much. You know, uh, do it in plain sight and nobody will ever question what it is. And uh, they had the, the documents in one compartment and the other two guys wrote the other one. And so, I mean, you know, it's literally all that stuff that was so valuable was guarded by one uh, 38 snub nose revolver that the Secret Urgent Service had. Uh, the next morning, the train arrives in Louisville. It's met by Secret Service agents and an armored car again. Then they picked up an army escort for the 45 miles down to, down to Fort Knox. Now, they had to get to Fort Knox, and the train had to be on time, because the vaults at Fort Knox are on a time uh, delay. You can't unlock them except, except the time is set in like 24 hours in advance. So they had to get there at 10.30 in the morning, because that's when the vault was going to open. Uh, now, it stayed down there until uh, April of 1943, and that was when they were dedicating the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C., on the Tidal Basin on the, the south end of the mall. And so they decided that since Jefferson was the guy that you know, basically came up with a lot of the words, like on the Declaration of Independence and everything, that we should have the Declaration on display. But of course, they hadn't told anybody it had left yet. So <laughs> they went back, and they brought back only that one document, 
Uh, same thing, put it on the overnight B&O train back to Washington, met it again, took it there, put it on display for a week uh, with 24 hour a day uh, green guards. And then when that celebration was over after a week, they did the same thing, packed it back up in a box, put it back on the train and sent it back to Fort Knox. It actually uh, stayed in Fort Knox until uh, September of 44. By then they decided nobody was gonna bomb Washington, D.C. And basically the, the war was, if not winding down, at least within sight. And so they decided to bring everything back. And so they had the uh, Provost Marshal uh, from Fort Knox uh, supply some MPs and some trucks, and they moved everything back out, took it down to Louisville. Same thing, moved through the back door of the station, put it in a regular sleeping car, <laughs> and uh, took it back to D.C. where it was met by the Secret Service at uh, Washington Union Station and taken to the Library of Congress, and then back on display uh, a couple weeks later. So October 44 is back on display, and like I got it bond there. What was not released about the fact was that they were ever gone. It came out because the Archibald McLeish, the Library of Congress, he wrote an article for the American Library Association magazine, you know, that the, all the librarians read it. And he told in there about how they moved it. That was the first way it ever came out. It was not released to anybody. It wasn't mentioned in Congress or anything like that. So it, it just kind of came out that way. So, and the other things, like I mentioned, there were other things, 5,000 cases of other documents that went to, to Lexington. They went to uh, Virginia Military Institute, William and Lee uh, College, uh, Oberlin, I think was the other one. But they also had moved 50 or 100 paintings from the uh, National Gallery, and those were stored at the uh, Biltmore House, the uh, Vanderbilt Mansion outside of Asheville, North Carolina, which was a big, huge, you know, palace. And uh, they had plenty of room to hang paintings and store them and everything. So anyway, if you happen to run into more of this stuff, uh, you know, they can give you my contact details over at the, at the archives and you can let us you know, add it into here because it's always good. Uh, at the end here, one of those things, what you're looking at, the, uh, the thing on the left is a gold dollar. And it happens to be mine. Uh, it, it's been, uh, had a little band uh, uh, soldered to it to make it where it could be a necklace or a bracelet or something. But on the right, you see that's a standard Roosevelt dime. So you can see the, the size of a gold dollar compared to a dime. They were smaller and they're thinner. And the thing right below it is a uh, $20 gold certificate. And uh, if you look at the bottom underneath George's picture, it says, you know, payable in gold coin to the bearer. P.G. Miller, are you going to comment about that? Yeah, we're going to find out. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, well, see, when uh, one of those things, and I, I somehow missed the slide, I guess, when I was messing on the arrows there, when the, when the presidential proclamation came out, uh, executive order, uh, in 1933, it says, you know, you're required to turn in all your money, take it to a bank, Federal Reserve, whatever, and it came out in, like, March, you had domain to turn in all your gold coins, all of those gold certificates, uh, and growing up as a kid, uh, my grandparents who lived next door, they had a big safe in the basement. And, uh, and somebody told me, and, I, and uh, you know, this is like sometime in the mid-1950s, they're, they're saying, yeah, there's gold coins in there. And uh, <laughs> later on, I, I'm thinking that once I kind of got into some of this as an adult, it's like, why did we have gold coins? They were illegal to have gold coins, you know? And it, it turned out there was actually an exemption. You could keep up to $100 worth. They just didn't want people hoarding money and then shipping it out of the country and that kind of stuff. So, uh, but, uh, and there were even Supreme Court cases that involved the uh, Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad where because they had a, a, a bond that they'd issued. Uh, and it was common back in those days and a lot of these things to issue ones that said, you know, payable in gold or whatever. You know, that was to, to, to verify that you were really getting value back when you invested, you bought a, a corporate bond from somebody. And so uh, it actually went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, yeah, I know it says that, but those contracts are still, you gotta, you know, you gotta take Federal Reserve notes. That's, that's just the way it is. And, and so it was an executive order. It was not a law. It never became a law. Mm -hmm. And then up until, uh, what was it, the 1980s or something, when it was basically uh, said, yeah, everybody can have gold again. But there was gold coins in my, in my grandparents' uh, safe, and always wondered about that. And, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago or so, uh, uh, my dad actually, uh, I have four other uh, brothers and sisters, he got us all together and he had 
envelopes, you know, labeled one, two, three, four, five, and he said, pick one. And we each picked one, we each had a gold coin in there. And mine happened to be a dollar. Uh, one of my brothers got a two and a half dollars. Somebody else, I think, got a five. I don't think we had any 20s. But, uh, but anyway, so uh, that's, that's my thing with gold. So uh, <laughs> anyway, so if we can get our uh, high tech expert here. Uh, if anybody has any quick questions before we get the next one uh, ready to go, I'll try to answer them. I don't know. Maybe this one. As far as I know, there were never. And, uh, and the one slide that I, I guess I somehow went past because I went back and forth on one of them is I actually tried to calculate it out in current money. And it, it's something like over $5 trillion. Because the, the price of gold uh, a couple days ago when I checked the last time was just a buck or so under $2,000 an ounce. Well, this was being moved at $35 an ounce, all those numbers that I gave you. So, uh, yeah, each train load came out to be something. Uh, or no, each car came out to be something like two hundred million dollars or something. Uh, and, and, you know, so you you take all those numbers that I gave you and basically uh, you know multiply by about ten, eight, something like that, and you come up with some really big numbers. My calculator got to one of those things where it just tells you you know add the right number of zeros because I can't keep going any farther. <laughs> Most people don't realize that the RPO service transferred all the money by the Federal Reserve. And every employee on that RPO car was armed. Right. They had a 38 stun gold flag shot and or shotguns in a rack on the wall. Yeah. And that's, of course, the, the big uh, train robbery at Rondout. That was because it was carrying mail from the Chicago Federal Reserve to Minneapolis. And it was uh, it was uh, $7 million worth or something like that in well, 1920. Like <laughs> yeah. And, but yeah, they were armed, and prior to that, they'd actually, uh, because there were mail truck robberies and stuff in Chicago in the 20s, and because it's the same reason, they're carrying cash, and they actually, starting about 1920, the post office had Marines assigned to guard the mail cars, Calvin Coolidge did that one, and they literally shot some people on the street, because the Marines were told, you know, shoot, kill, you know, on, to defend the mail truck, and so, and they did. So, yeah, Bob. Did the railroad, you said the railroad supplied crews today, is there any evidence that they, looked at their engineers and and or did they just get stuck with a train at six in the morning and they didn't know what it was yeah or? i don't know it. i don't know it because like if they were moving the president they actually you know checked or you know they, they would normally take you know the senior guy or whatever you know but they actually the secret service would vet them a little bit i don't know if these guys just came off the extra board or you know how they did it i i, I couldn't find anything specific well, enough. normally tell you an extra train it probably would have just been Hey, you're doing it today. Yeah, yeah, yeah whatever, yeah. Uh, hard to tell. No, but, not that there were any dishonest engineers <laughs> on the railroad. Well, I, and, and, you know, if you were going to uh, help out with uh, you and your gang buddies to uh, try to rob it, I mean, like I said, I, on the IC, IC, the one uh, uh, special agent, the one railroad cop, he's standing right behind you with a shotgun. You know, not to mention the 40 Army guys in the back, you know, and, and the mail clerks and everybody else. So. Okay, so.